1st of this year. Your incident period is February 11th through the 19th. And again, this important date, your request for public assistance or RPA deadline is June 3, 2021. If you have any questions, you can contact your assigned program delivery manager and your assigned state contact. Uh, something that we're doing differently this on this disaster is we have, uh, most of you are familiar with the district of your area coordinators. So what we've done, we have divided up the PA staff to assist um, the counties by district. So we're trying to offer you better customer service and have just one person to go to instead of calling the office and getting multiple uh, people involved in your uh, questioning and different answers and so forth. So hopefully this will provide better customer service. We're gonna try to do this uh, for this disaster and for future disasters so that you'll be accustomed to have someone that you can call directly. And that person, once things uh, settle down, will be able to come out to your district to personally meet you and the, the other county district. Also, you can email your questions to recovery1 at mema.ms.gov and be sure to include the disaster number in the subject line along with the, the item, the questioning line of questioning that you like answered. Here's our uh, area coordinator district. The, colors in green are the counties that are declared on the initial declaration. The add-on counties will be uh, added subsequently. That would be Tunica, Webster, Clay, and Tippa. They're not colored yet. And on this map, you'll see uh, the project officer from MEMA that's assigned to that particular district in the left-hand corner and to include the band of Choctaw Indians. We're gonna briefly talk about what the definition of public assistance is, who can be an applicant, what a facility is, the work involved and the cost involved to repair your damages from this event. Public assistance is a supplemental financial assistance to the state and local governments and certain private nonprofit organizations for response and recovery activities required as a result of a federally declared disaster. And the funding cost at a federal share of no less than 75% of eligible costs. So if you're a county or a city, your cost share is gonna be 75% from the federal side and 25% split with the state. So it'd be 12 and a half percent for you, the applicant and 12 and a half percent for the state. And what we'd like to do is when you have completed your projects, we a hundred percent, we do a final inspection on your smalls and your largest. And then we fund that 12 and a half percent back to you for completing those projects in a timely manner. If you are a private nonprofit, such as electric power association, you only receive 75%. There is no cost share with the state. Here again, the government agencies will receive 75% reimbursement and the state will have 12.5% and you the applicant 12.5%. And again, nonprofit agencies will receive 75% federal reimbursement. The public assistance program assists the restoration of community infrastructure as a result of a federally declared event. It is a supplemental cost reimbursement program where you, the applicant, has to spend the money, produce documentation and invoice such as invoices and copies of your canceled checks where you have paid and expended those funds to rebuild back and, and turn those in for your projects and then and only then do we reimburse it. However, we do help you if you have some issues. Uh, we're here to help the state. You're a part of our communities and we wanna help you all we can do uh, within the bounds of the program. The FEMA share of eligible costs will be available to the recipient for disbursement to the applicants. Public assistance is not assistance to local 
populations for damages to private homes, commercial property, or local businesses. Public assistance is only for the uh, county, the cities, private nonprofits. Private homes will fall under individual assistance with that, which that's under another uh, part of the MEMA. It's not here at public assistance. There's a partnership between the federal, the state, and the applicant in order to manage these grants. FEMA manages the programs and provides technical assistance and approves the grants. And the state, which is the recipient, we educate our applicants and work with FEMA to manage the program, implements and monitors the grants awarded, and we pay you the, um, the funds until you close out as an applicant. And you as a sub-recipient, you identify damages and you provide the documentation and help manage these funds to, to close out as well. This is the eligibility pyramid. You have cost, work, facility, and applicant. We'll begin at the bottom. In order to be an eligible applicant, you must have be in a federally declared county. Uh, you must be, you know, either a city or a, um, or a county or a private nonprofit. Uh, on the facility that you have damaged, you must be responsible for that facility, such as your county roads. Uh, the work has to be eligible. It has to be part of the category A through G categories as, as part of this uh, grant program. And then the cost has to be a reasonable cost based on historical and professional uh, engineer costs in order to prepare that cost back to pre-disaster conditions. Again, eligible applicants are the state. The state itself can be an applicant, declared counties, cities and towns and villages within the declared counties, uh, other political subdivisions of the state, uh, Native American tribes, and certain private nonprofit organizations. To be eligible, a private nonprofit applicant, the private nonprofit must show that he is a current ruling letter from the IRS granting tax exemption under 501 C, D, or E, or the Internal Revenue Code of 1954, or documentation from the Mississippi State Secretary's Office sub substantiating it as a non-revenue producing nonprofit entity doing business under the state law. Two categories of private nonprofits are critical services, such as your fire departments, medical uh, ambulance services, your, par your power and water and sewer utilities, communication systems, and educational facilities. And they're both eligible for emergency work as well as permanent work. Non-critical essential services are things such as museums, community centers, libraries, houses of worship, and senior citizens centers. Non-critical essential private nonprofits must first apply to a small for a small business administration, otherwise known as the SBA, for a disaster loan for permanent repair work before applying to FEMA. So if you are a house of worship or any other private nonprofit, you must, that's a non-critical essential service, you must apply for a small business loan. And if you get denied, FEMA is going to want a copy of your denial letter or email before they allow you to, to participate in this program. Facility eligibility. To be eligible, the facility must be damaged as a result of the declared event, located within the presidentially declared area, and must be the legal responsibility for an eligible applicant, and not be under the authority of a federal agency. All right, um, I've been doing this for 13 years, and we still have some applicants that want to declare damages that were not a result of the declared event. So be mindful that you have got to show us that this uh, damage was a result of this winter storm. Also, you must be within the pres presidentially declared area. If you're a county that was not declared, then you're not eligible. Also, you must have the legal responsibility. And if you, uh, an example would be if you uh, maintain roads uh, close to a, let's say, a federal uh, historical park. If you, if the park service has a legal responsibility, but for some reason down the, the years, the city took that responsibility to 
to maintain that. If you don't have any legal binding agreement with the Park Service, then that legal responsibility rests with the federal legal or federal Park Service and not the city. Uh, also, there's a lot of federal highways that run through our county systems. So if your street that runs through the town is part of a federal highway main collector, then that falls on the authority of the federal highway system and is not considered a county road. And we have uh, maps and MDOT has provided us with their maps for every county and FEMA utilizes that as well to make sure that those roads when you're trying to claim damages to those roads do not fall under an FHWA. Types of work by category. We have emergency work, which includes category A, debris removal, and category B, emergency protective measures. Permanent work, you have C through G. C is roads and bridges. D is water control features. Uh, e is public buildings and equipment. Category F is public utilities. And category G is others uh, in parks and recreation. FEMA is authorized to provide public assistance funding for emergency work. To include... Could you mute your mic, please? To include the emergency protective measures and debris removal. Emergency work is that, uh, is that work that's done prior to the event, during the event, and after the event, and it's usually about 72 hours, but it's work that you did on your uh, in your community to save lives, protect the public health and safety, protect improved property and eliminate or lessen the immediate threat of additional damages. Debris removal is eligible when it eliminates an immediate threat to life, health and safety. It eliminates an immediate threat of significant damage to improved property and it ensures economic recovery of the community and provides a benefit for the community at large. Some of the do's on category A is you must contact MDEQ for staging sites. It has to be an approved site for the, the health and safety of the community. For example, we had one uh, town uh, in a past disaster that had staged a site uh, in the town itself in an old uh, it was a, an abandoned building in the downtown area and they were stacking debris up against that business that was, it was no longer a business there, but it was a building that was, you know, like attached to other buildings in the city. And if that debris pile for some reason were to catch on fire, it would have burned a whole city block down. So you must get with DEQ and get permitted for your staging sites. You must remember church, uh, truck certifications. These trucks must be certified and it's just a, a decal that they put on the truck that certifies that truck as a, for example, 20 cubic yard truck. And uh, that must be done. You must have debris monitors. You can contract this out or you, the applicant, can use your own force account labor. You can hire someone to remove the debris and you can act as your own monitoring uh, service for that project. But you must have a monitoring service. Activate your um, pre-position contractor and bid out debris work beyond 30 days from the storm. Uh, a lot of counties after Katrina have pre-positioned contractors. You can utilize that in case uh, in this event. However, at the end of 30 days, you, FEMA wants you to rebid that project out. Uh -huh. All right, don'ts. You don't stage your debris wherever you want, and you don't place debris in un unpermitted sites. Debris must be hauled to a permanent resting place in a permitted landfill. And there's several types of debris. Uh, you got hazardous waste, you got household goods. Uh, in, you know, for example, in a tornado, uh, this mixed in with vegetated debris. Some landfills take it all, some want it uh, uh, pulled apart, so they only take household goods at cer certain permitted sites as well as hazardous materials, uh, and then vegetated debris are taken at most sites. Uh, you do not continue your pre-position contract beyond 30 days. 
And you do not forget that you need a debris monitoring service, whether it's a contracted service or you using utilizing your force account labor to manage this project. Category B, emergency protective measures. Actions taken uh, by- Mr. Gregory, this is Deborah Sullivan, and I am with the Nantawoya Water Association. Uh, we are needing to do a road bore on uh, Highway 490. Miss Deborah. And uh, we need to get going on a permit for that. Uh, they're wanting to know if we can use. Can you meet your mic, Miss Deborah Sullivan? Okay. All right. So the uh, electric uh, emergency protective measures are actions taken by you, the applicant, before, during, and after a disaster to help save lives, protect public health and safety, and prevent damage to improve property. This includes your search and rescue and, and fire and flood fighting. Your security such as barricades and fencing and the utilization of law enforcement at certain road intersections to protect people to not go down the roads that are flooded or have been damaged or fallen debris and the push of debris not disposal of the debris but push and shove debris off of your roadways to open it up for emergency vehicles once you, if you were to come back and pick up that debris to move it to a permitted landfill that would fall under category a Eligible permanent work, category C through G, you must repair, restore, or replace disaster damage facilities in accordance with regulations. They must restore to pre-disaster design capacity and function in accordance with applicable codes and standards. And you must be required as, it must be required as a result of the disaster and may include cost-effective hazard mitigation measures. All right, we have uh, some categories on C right here, roads, which includes your road surface, your base materials, as well as the shoulders and ditches alongside those roads. When you have bridge repairs, you're talking about the decking, abutments, wing walls, and approaches to the bridge, and drainage structure, structures such as culverts and cross drains. These are um, the, the MDOT map that I was telling you about earlier where many roads are federal aid roads throughout the counties and they come color coded and you can go down on, uh, go to the MDOT's website and look at this to see which ones would be eligible. And they're color coded here. You have a minor arterial, major collector, minor collector, um, and, and the interstate, of course, is gonna be a federal highway so this, this lets you know, so you can let your PDMG with FEMA know which roads are eligible. Category D is your uh, pumping and drainage and irrigation systems like, like the levy for the Ross Barnett Reservoir would be uh, one, one to fall under category D. If you have sewage lagoons, that would fall under category D. Category E is buildings and equipment. Um, that includes your buildings, your contents. There's a 50% rule where FEMA, um, if, if they determine that the building that's heavily damaged, if you can repair it, if it's less than 50% damage, uh, then you can repair it. And uh, if it's over 50%, then they will rule it uh, over 50% where you can demo the whole building uh, to rebuild a new building. You have to meet current codes and standards. Uh, equipment is part of your uh, category E, as well as your buildings and supplies. And make sure that you remember that um, any, anything that's covered by insurance, the insurance is deductible and the salvage value is deductible off that project as well. So uh, we will need a copy of your current insurance that was in place prior to the disaster. Um, you can upload that into the portal and FEMA will look at that and they, they have insurance specialists that look at this and they will write the project based on anticipated insurance amount. However, 
it, once you receive your insurance uh, check from your insurance for your damages, we would like for you to upload copies of those as well, because we have found in past disasters where some insurance companies have shortchanged you as the applicant. Uh, some have, have even uh, have been generous to you and giving you more than what your insurance policy calls for. So be mindful of that. Category F is your, your utilities, which is power and generation and distribution centers, your water and sewage treatment plants, uh, lift stations, your telecommunication systems, and damages must be as a result of this event. And of course, finally, you got category G, your parks and recreation to include playgrounds, swimming pools, ballparks, piers, and beaches. Of course, all of these have to, have to be the responsibility of you, the applicant, such as a city or town, or if you're, if you're a, um, a college, you have to have responsibility for these uh, facilities to be, uh, get reimbursement for. Administrative costs. This is something fairly new to many of y'all. Um, in the past, each project was given 3% of the cost as a direct administrative cost where you could claim those costs that, that you expended on preparing for that project over the life of it through this process that went over and above your normal day-to-day -day duties. Um, recently, FEMA came up with this project called a Category Z. And what they do, they cap it at 5%. So they gave you a little extra money, but they calculate all of your projects. Once all your projects are obligated, then they'll write a category Z, which is capped at 5% of your total costs. For some reason, there's been some misunderstanding on the front end of the disaster. Um, we've had applicants to say that FEMA did not inform them of this and they did not keep any records. So be, be for sure that on the very front end of this thing, and, and I'm sure you've already accumulated costs trying to uh, get all this information together, start uh, calculating this cost and you can claim your force account labor. So anybody within your agency that's helping you, uh, you'll, you'll wanna calculate that with time sheets or just a calendar that says, you know, I, I spent uh, three hours on this day collecting this information. Your force account equipment, you can utilize your vehicles and your machinery that you use to, to put this project together and your force account materials such as paper, um, ink cartridges or anything like that. So start calculating those. Once you uh, meet with FEMA after the initial meeting, you can start recording these costs and you can claim up to 5% of these of your total damages. The Stafford Act, Section 324, authorized PA funding for management costs, which is indirect costs and administrative expenses. You can also, um, some of y'all are going out to uh, hire consultants to do this for you, since y'all, uh, many say that you do not have time to manage this yourself. If you do that, you must make sure that you use proper federal and state procurement rules and regulations to hire these individuals. And once you do, they, uh, some difference, uh, um, another confusion aspect of this is if you hire a management consultant to manage your calls, then that's strictly what they do. Um, for example, we had some people trying to use this to fund their uh, cost on their um, county engineers. A county engineer, if they, charging you an expense on a project, for example, let's say a bridge repair. When, when you get the information to FEMA to write that project, whether it's a small project or a large project, make sure that you capture that cost of your engineer in that project. And that's, that's where you'll get reimbursed or your engineer will get reimbursed on the project. A management cost is strictly for the management cost. You don't commingle the, the two expenses. So just be mindful of that. Of course, you got preliminary damage assessments, your meetings regarding the PA program. You've got site inspections where you go out in the county with FEMA. So you get to record your, your uh, vehicle log time for that. Organizing damage sites into logical groups and any correspondence. And funding is based on actual costs up to 
5%, you can get 100% of those monies back to you. To be eligible for reimbursement, costs must be reasonable and necessary to accomplish eligible work. And what does FEMA say about costs being reasonable? It is if in its nature and amount, it does not exceed that which would be incurred by a prudent person under the circumstances prevailing at the time the applicant makes the decision to incur the cost. So if something got damaged and, and uh, you as the applicant think that, well, this is a good time that we can upgrade to something that's um, you know gold plated that we've been wanting for the county or the city for a long time. That is not a prudent cost. And you have to make sure that you're, you're rebuilding the project back to pre-disaster condition. The eligible for reimbursement costs must comply with federal, state, and local laws and regulations, authorized and not prohibited under federal, state, territorial, tribal, or local government laws or regulations, and consistent with the applicant's internal policies, regulations, and procedures that apply uniformly to both federal awards and other activities of the applicant. Also include deductions of insurance proceeds, salvage values, and purchase discounts. Uh, I think you, you, under, you understand about insurance proceeds and salvage value, but I had an applicant in a past disaster that wanted to raise money to help offset some of their costs on a, a project. So be mindful that if you have a private fund or any organization within your community that's raising money to offset your cost for damages, FEMA will be, uh, for example, let's say you raised $50,000 to rebuild back the children's playground. Uh, FEMA will use that $50,000 and deduct it off of, off of that and utilize it just like insurance or salvage value from your total project costs before they uh, you know, finalize your cost for that project. Force account labor. Force account labor is what FEMA calls your individuals that work for you as the county or the city. Um, of course, force account equipment would be the, your city owned equipment or county owned equipment and force account materials would be like um, for a county level be any gravel or sand or anything like that that you, you stock up in your, in your uh, county barns um, to repair roads and such. Category A, your debris removal, and clearance, they, you would need to capture your regular or straight time and overtime, including fringe benefits are eligible according to the recovery, the Sandy Recovery Act of 2013. Uh, category B is emergency protective measures, which only overtime is eligible. And of course you must show your straight time to show that you actually went into overtime to claim that overtime. And this is overtime on your labor only. Um, Category C through G is your regular time and straight time and overtime are eligible. On materials, the cost of these items from the applicant's inventory or stock and for items purchased to make authorized repairs to meet the scope of work are eligible. Applicant owned equipment, the cost associated with the equipment used to perform authorized repairs, all operating equipment hours are eligible, should be supported by labor timesheets and base rates, rates based on FEMA schedule of equipment rates. Um, just make sure that, you know, when you turn in your force account labor and force account equipment that we have, you know, you must have someone to actually operate that equipment in order to claim that equipment time. For example, if, if someone is driving a county truck out to a site to repair a road and they're pulling on a trailer a backhoe to help in the process, that backhoe cannot be claimed until you come to the site and unload it. Uh, you can claim the, the, uh, the travel of the truck, your county vehicle, and that trailer. You can claim it going to the site and coming back from the site. Uh, but once it is parked on the side of the road, you can't claim any more until you get back in that truck and take it back to the office. Uh, then on your backhoe, uh, when you start commencing work on that project, you can utilize the hours to prepare that project on your uh, equipment. Um, 
FEMA has a schedule of equipment rates that they update periodically that's online. And this would be uh, the rates that are, that are in effect right before the disaster. Uh, for example, they give you your, your, your cost for your vehicle or equipment is inclusive of your fuel cost and your repair cost. So a long time ago, they used to, you, they used to reimburse you for fuel and uh, any repairs on that equipment. But now they, they're more generous and they give you a, a flat rate for all the equipment uh, with, a, with equipment rates that includes your repairs and your fuel costs. If your equipment does not appear on that time, on that equipment rate sheet, they, they allow you to go up one size on the engine size or whatever to claim that particular time. Types of projects, you have small projects, large projects, improved projects, and alternate projects. And the public assistance projects are processed as either small or large projects. And if the project cost is less than the annually updated cost threshold amount, which is currently for this disaster, 132,801, the project is processed as a small project. So anything under that amount, that threshold is a small project. And if the project cost exceeds that threshold, then it is a large project. In formulating your small projects, be mindful that you have all of your projects cost reported to FEMA when you're formulating that. Uh, we've had in the past where people have inadvertently left off either an invoice in the repair of the project, which is substantial, or they left off their engineer cost. And on a small project, once it's obligated, it is hard to go back and put that uh, cost in there. In fact, they have something called a small project netting where it allows them to open up all of your small projects. And if they find anything out of the norm where they had a mistake on FEMA themselves, then they can start de-obligating uh, other costs of your small projects. So it just opens up a Pandora's box. So make sure that you have all of your costs captured when you're writing small projects, because it's hard to open those back up and you don't want to do that. Um, of course, on large projects, you know, they pay on actual costs. So anything over that, when you report everything, uh, it's easier to adjust that in an amendment uh, at, the, at the closeout process. Small projects, the funding is based on work completed if available or initial cost estimate. On your small projects, um, FEMA on this process, uh, the last couple of years has something called an app cert Whereas if they go out there and, you, and they write a project where you are 100% complete on that project, let's say you replaced a culvert, uh, the project, you know, the culvert's in place, the roadway's repaired, they will write that project on your cost and they will call it an app cert. So that project is 100% complete and we can go ahead and fund that project uh, as quickly as possible. Your federal cost share is paid upon project approval and when the cost of work is less than 33, $20, $3,320, that work is not eligible because that's too small for that. Uh, that's the threshold for to write a project period. Your large projects initially approved based on estimated cost. Funding is based on documented actual cost and federal cost share is paid as work is accomplished. Improved projects, applicants performing restoration work on a damaged facility may use this opportunity to make improvements to the facility while restoring the facility to its pre-disaster function. And the, the improvements must be approved by the state prior to construction. Makes, uh, it may require a FEMA environmental and historical assessment. The applicant is responsible for the cost of the improvements. Federal funding is limited to the cost of restoration. For example, in this uh, example here, the before picture, this is a, uh, looks like a building, a school building that was built probably in the 50s. Uh, as you know, buildings are uh, built that time period are probably all small rooms and so forth. And let's say the applicant wanted to rebuild back, this, this building looks like it's over 50% damaged and they want to build something back more modern, more open, more light-filled, 
and that's why the, the, the oops, excuse me. That's why the picture, it's, um, it's a brand new facility there to, to the after photo. Alternate projects. Again, you can utilize this program. Let's say, for example, this building here was not being used, but just a couple of rooms. Uh, most of it was used for storage. The school says, I, we don't really need to build this building back because it was, it was pretty much vacant anyway. So we would like to take the monies uh, that we could get from build, building it back because we really need new buses. So you can use that as an alternate project. Again, it must be approved by FEMA prior to construction and a request for the alternate project must be made within 12 months of the recovering scoping meeting or your RSM. The alternate project may require an environmental assessment. Federal funding is limited to 90% of the federal share of the original project estimate or actual alternate project costs, whichever is less, for state and local governments or 75% for private nonprofit applicants utilizing the traditional alternate project program. In other words, this, this project is capped. Uh, you're not gonna get any additional funding because you chose the improved or your alternate project amount. So the project, you know, once you've supplied all the costs estimates and it is approved by FEMA, then that project is capped. Project period of performance. Time limits for project completion begin on the disaster declaration date. Emergency work must be completed within six months and permanent work must be completed within 18 months. If you are not able to meet these deadlines, the state can grant you an additional six months on emergency work after that, we have to go to FEMA and on permanent work, the state can grant you up to four years after the declaration date. However, we want you to complete these projects in a timely manner. So we don't wanna wait four years to complete something, but the state can grant you up to four years. After that, we have to ask FEMA. The recipient can grant time, uh, which the state can grant time extension for extenuating circumstances. Those include, uh, those extensions are emergency work up to additional six months, permanent work up to additional 30 months. The regional administrator may increase these time extensions on a case by case basis. Note, if the deadline for any project has been reached without an approved time extension, no cost past the deadline date will be eligible for funding. So if you're coming up and you know that you're not going to meet your deadline, please request uh, that there are ways to request uh, through grants portal. However, this, this uh, system has a glitch in it that for some reason it's not notifying the state or FEMA. So we ask you for this disaster until that problem is resolved to just write us a, a time extension request on your letterhead and email it to your MEMA project officer and the state will, can handle it from there and grant your time extension. So make sure that you request one before the time actually expires. Special considerations are issues other than program eligibility that could affect the scope of work and funding of a project. These include insurance, hazard mitigation, environmental protection, floodplain management, historical preservation, and cultural resources. Insurance, actual or anticipated insurance proceeds will be deducted from the eligible cost, the project costs for facilities that are insured. All applicants are required to obtain and maintain insurance coverage on all insurable facilities as a condition of public assistance funding. So if you're required to maintain insurance on a building and two years later, you decide we just don't have the funds to, to afford this insurance, so we're going to let it lapse. In the future, if that building becomes damaged and you make another claim on it, FEMA has records um, that you asked for uh, reimbursement on that in the past. They can deny that they will expend fundings for, for that particular building because you let the insurance lapse. They, they're wanting the insurance, everyone to insure their uh, facilities to make sure they won't have to pay it twice. For flood damage facilities located within a special flood hazard area, 
that are not covered by flood insurance, federal assistance will be reduced by the maximum flood insurance proceeds that will have been payable had the facility been insured. We found this to be the case uh, during the 2011 Mississippi River historic flooding. FEMA did this on several projects where they did not have flood insurance and FEMA implemented the flood insurance as if they did and made the appropriate reductions. 406 hazard mitigation. This is, um, this is funding that's available. They put uh, money from disasters into a pot and you can uh, uh, utilize that to make uh, hazard mitigation, implement hazard mitigations in your county, such as you need to go up a larger culvert size or con uh, build concrete wing walls. If the pre-disaster is there's no wing walls and then the, after the 406 mitigation, you reinforce that facility with wing walls and riprap. EHP compliance. This is a big, big, big thing that we need to be aware of. All FEMA funded projects must comply with a variety of environmental and historic preservation laws, regulations, and executive orders. It, it just seems like it's, it's a whole lot, and it is a whole lot, but we're here, we know the drill, and we try to keep you on the, the straight and narrow when it comes to this. So just be mindful of this. And if you have any uh, issues or questions on this, uh, please talk it, discuss it with your project officer. EHP review is done prior to funding to ensure compliance is applicable with the federal laws. Uh, your EHP review is a collaboration between FEMA, the state, and you as the applicant or tribe and local organizations. Construction of new facilities, alternate projects, modification, expansion, or mitigation of exi existing facilities may require more extensive EHP review. Environmental protection, to ensure that all practical means are used to protect, restore, and enhance the environment, FEMA requires projects that must comply with all applicable laws and regulations, including NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act is a big one, Clean Air Act is a big one, and 44 CFR parts 9 and 10. Uh, just be mindful that um, you must get a permit from the state if you're going to burn. I don't know if they're going to allow, um, this is not a a large debris disaster, such as a, something resulting from a tornado or hurricane. So we probably won't run in this issue, but just in future disasters, just be mindful that there are limitations on burning debris and they usually don't allow that unless it's a catastrophic um, area where there's lots of debris and they can't manage it properly. Floodplain and wetland management. Many of your projects may fall within a floodplain or a wetland area. So they're gonna to wanna to make sure that we abide by these executive orders, such as the floodplain management protection of wetlands or the Clean Water Act. Historic preservation and cultural resources. If you have a, a old building in your town uh, that you know it has historical significance, bring that to the attention of your MEMA and your FEMA project officer when formulating these projects. FEMA, the state and the applicant work together to identify and address these historic preservation issues before approval of funding for a public assistance project. And it will require consultation with the state historical preservation office, otherwise known as SHPO, any tribes uh, preservation office uh, officer, and advisory council on historic preser preservation, such as your Indian mounds or any of your national uh, state parks. Record keeping, make sure that you're documenting your cost well and that you maintain these um, documentations for three years after applicant closeout. You're, you're required to maintain complete accurate documentation by project for all disaster related costs and maintain these for three years after applicant closeout. You're maintaining, your, you're keeping all the records for your small projects and you must document your large project. And you, when you turn those in, we, we send a, a, a final um, 
uh, inspection report to FEMA to close out those large projects. So we have your documentation there, but you the, as the applicant must maintain your documentation for small projects. Force account labor is part of your documentation, force account equipment, force account material. If you had to rent a, a piece of equipment, you, you need to keep your invoice and your rental contract agreement on that in any contract. Make sure that you're following all federal and state procurement laws on uh, contracting services out and make sure you, you have uh, all your bid tabs, your, your signed contract when it comes to contracts. Force account labor. We need your applicant's payroll policy prior to the disaster, uh, your benefits calculation worksheet because they FEMA not only reimburses your hourly wage, but they, they calculate your benefit such as your health costs, vacation time, and they give you a little extra money for each uh, of your county employees on that. Applicants complete employee list. This should include the employee rate and you must show if it's exempt versus non-exempt employees, uh, time sheets and payroll records and copies of canceled checks or um, proof of direct deposit. Force account equipment. Uh, we would need an applicant's equipment listing or your manifest, equipment documentation sheets, employee time sheets reflecting equipment operated at the time and the date of use, and FEMA schedule equipment rates. Force account materials. You have a material summary record. Uh, a lot of these on like, a, for example, on the county or city level, let's say you, you, you put out um, bids for materials such as gravel and so forth on a yearly basis, you may not have an invoice. That invoice may be 18 months old, the last time you purchased gravel. We would just need a copy of that invoice and a copy of the cancel check uh, where you pay for that in order to claim these materials on these uh, current projects. Procurement. This is another thing that FEMA looks at heavily. They wanna make sure that you're abiding by the, the most stringent rules of federal, state, and local requirement, whichever is the most stringent. Uh, if you need to uh, research some of this, this is an excellent link to go to, to keep you out of the hot water because it's, we, it, it never fails on every disaster. We have someone that just did not procure something properly and it affects their eligibility. Rental equipment, again, we need copies of your signed rental agreement, invoices, and proof of payment. Appeals, any determination related to federal assistance may be appealed. The appeal must be submitted in writing to the state within 60 days of receipt of notice of the action being repealed. The state has 60 days from receipt of appeal letter to forward it to FEMA, and FEMA has 90 days to render a decision. Two levels of appeal are to the regional administrator and to the assistant administrator for disaster assistance directory. Um, with this new grants portal, uh, some of y'all like it, some of y'all don't, some of y'all don't know anything about it. This is your first time, but this grants portal is an, and we'll talk about it here in a minute, but it is an internet based management program that I'm telling you, the state would not be able to handle the numerous disasters that we were hit with over the last year and a half. Um, it's a good program. It's it, one day it was, it's gonna be administered by the state only with just a handful of FEMA people because it's just, you know, the government is stretched too thin to, to bring in a hundred people per disaster. So it's gonna be up to us, the state and you as the applicant to work through these, to manage our own grants in the future. Uh, so FEMA has put timelines with anything that you want to do when you're planning something, you have to uh, have timelines and goals to meet so that you can get whatever you're trying to achieve done in a timely manner. So there will be timelines that FEMA gives you in order to give uh, to present this documentation in a timely manner so that they can formulate your projects because they're not going to be, especially coming up on hurricane season, they're going to be pulled to another disaster. And um, we want to make sure that your projects 
are formulated and obligated. And what I mean by that, that they have put the money in the bank, in, in the state bank, so that we can fund you and reimburse you on these projects. Um, many of these appeals that go out or determination memos are, are a result of people not uh, in a timely manner turning in documentation to prove the expenses they have on these projects. And it's, it's, it's taxing for you as the applicant, it's frustrating for you because we can't get you any money if we don't have a project. Uh, it's taxing for us because, um, you know, we have a, a regular job as far as managing this disaster, as far as managing these older disasters as well. So we don't like determination memos or appeals either. And you can see here by these dates, they give you 60 days, another 60 days, and FEMA has 90 days, but they're the federal government and they had the final say. And I assure you from past experience, they, they can sit on it longer than 90 days. So it's just frustrating for everyone. So I implore you to please work closely with your MEMA project officer and your FEMA PDMG to get this documentation that they request to you in a timely manner so they can get your projects formulated and we can get you paid on those small projects. The applicant must submit a request for public assistance or your RPA within 30 days. And that date is June the 3rd of this year, the deadline of the respective area being designated in the declaration. Applicants must submit all damages within 60 days from the recovery scoping meeting, formerly called the kickoff meeting. So when, when you uh, plan on your recovery scoping meeting, you need to make sure that you have a spreadsheet or something to identify all of your damages. And when I say identify all of your damages, for example, if you have a, a culvert a series of culverts that has a head wall and pipes and all that, you need to detail, give a detailed damage inventory item of that facility. So you're gonna, you're gonna record your head wall, your pipes, um, your riprap, if you had riprap there, anything that you lost that you wanna rebuild back prior to disaster, and that's gonna be discussed in your recovery scoping meeting. And you have 60 days from that meeting uh, to record all, to report all of your damages. And for example, we had an applicant in the past disaster that a lot of emergency managers rely on people in the county or their supervisors to say, you know, give them the all clear that uh, they've rec uh, recorded or reported all their damages. But we had someone that was in the, it was a remote area of the county where very little people went. And um, at the last minute, they were, I mean, I'm talking about a day or two before the 60 day deadline, they found uh, their damage that, that no one had reported. So if they would have went past that 60 day deadline that they, they couldn't get uh, any reimbursement on that item. So just make sure that, make sure you have all of your damages for your recovery scope of meeting, but remember, if something falls through the cracks, you have 60 days after that date of your RSM to uh, identify that damage. Debris removal operations, your straight time and your force count labor are eligible. And the applicant can retain earnings from recycling, such as uh, grinding up your debris into chips. Your permanent work section 428, the grants based on estimates, which is capped. Your cost overrun absorbed by the applicant. Underrun can be used by an applicant for specific mitigation uses, uh, must be approved by FEMA. An uh, applicant may consolidate multiple projects in one project worksheet, and FEMA may accept an applicant's license engineer cost estimate. It must be sure of your cost overruns and permit work is common. So this 428 project, for example, if, if, this, if you have all your, your costs calculated and you say it's gonna cost me $100,000 for this project and they write the project for $100,000 and you come in at $75,000 underrun, uh, if this was a large project, you know, FEMA would adjust that back to the actual cost. 
but now they will, this is a small project because that $100,000 falls under that 130 some odd thousand dollar um, cost. So what FEMA is going to do, they can, they will give you uh, that 20, since you're under run $25,000, they will allow you to use that $25,000. It's got some strange strings attached to it. You have to get those costs removed, but let's say you have, um, things damaged that didn't meet that $3,300 uh, threshold to, to be a project, or you had some other things in the county that you really want to spend money on, and FEMA will allow you to use the funding for that. Grants portal. This is what I uh, mentioned briefly uh, before. This is a, a internet-based portal that's, that uh, helps to manage our grants. Uh, you go through the portal, you, you sign up for your RPA as your first introduction to it. You can go in there and, and check the workflow of your grants to see what process they're in, uh, see where they're being formulated. You can put up notes, documentation, comments. Uh, it's just an excellent program. It does have some glitches. We will provide uh, some training on this for those that are not familiar with that uh, on grants portal. We will need to, if you're going to be the applicant agent, we need an applicant agent that is familiar with your damages. Um, for example, if, if uh, you have primarily road damage in the county, uh, we would like for either the road manager to be the applicant agent, uh, or if, uh, if the mayor wants to be the applicant agent, then he can be, or he or she could be the applicant agent, but make your road manager your alternate agent. Um, just someone that's familiar with the, the damages. Also on your, uh, the applicant agent, the primary applicant agent will only have signature rights. Your alternate agent will not. If you have, a, have a hired a consultant that is not an employee of your entity, you would need to make them your alternate agent and it need, your primary signature authority, authority agent needs to be someone that actually works for your, your town or city or county that has a signature authority. We talked about submitting your RPA through the grants portal prior to, this is the first thing you need to do when you get off the call today to make sure that you have access to grants portal so that we can put you in there if you do not have that. If you've participated in this process in the past, you still should be in there. Some of your information will need to be uploaded such as your current insurance policy that was in effect prior to this event. Uh, so get with us to get with your project officer from MEMA to help you assist you with this. And this just shows you how you can go, the screenshot that goes to request for public assistance. If you do not have an account in grants portal, please send us an email so we can get you. We need this information, your name, your tax ID, your DUNS number is DUNS and Bradstreet. If you're not familiar with that, Google that and uh, call that 800 number and get your DUNS number. And then we need a point of contact, name and position and phone number and an email address of someone that's going to be your primary agent that has signature authority. And we'd like for someone to be the alternate that we can uh, discuss this, the problems or issues with you when the primary is not available. Once your RPA is approved, you will be contacted by your FEMA program delivery manager or PDMG or from your MEMA or FEMA or either from MEMA or FEMA to initiate several meetings. A lot of these meetings will be generated through an invitation through the grants portal. They'll send you uh, emails or you'll have bells that will uh, be lit up into the program to notify you or notifications that you have upcoming appointments with FEMA, with your PDMGs to discuss formulating your projects. Phase one is the operational planning. You have FEMA assigns the program de delivery manager. Um, we have a JFO that will be established here at MEMA in Pearl. 
JFO stands for Joint Field Officer Office. That would be uh, the FEMA and MEMA people together for this project for this uh, disaster. Your PDMG completes the exploratory call. That's they're going to call you the, to the applicant and they're introducing themselves and they're going to briefly discuss with you about your uh, damages. Uh, they'll set up uh, your initial meeting to discuss your damage inventory and uh, you'll have some people from EHP, your historical and environmental to discuss what they need to discuss with you on the front end before you get started on your project. And then your, your PDMG conducts your recovery scoping meeting and that's where you will have all your uh, damages identified so that you can discuss those intelligently on this meeting and don't forget you have 60 days past this meeting to report any damages that have fallen to the cracks. The applicant completes your initial damage inventory. Uh, again, you capture all your damage related uh, damages and submit through the grants portal. Your initial damage inventory is submitted before your recovery scoping meeting. PDMG conducts the scope in the RSM or your recovery scoping meeting. Your damage inventories are discussed. Your documentation is discussed. Any special considerations, like if you're in a floodplain area or close to a historical area, your 60 day calendar again is discussed and site inspections will be discussed. Be mindful that uh, because several parts of the country are still in COVID mode, uh, these most likely site inspections will be done remotely with information provided by you with pictures and documentation to help formulate your project. However, if we have, if FEMA determines something is, is a, on a case by case basis, such as a large um, category A debris area or something uh, historically significant, a on site by person from the state or FEMA will be necessary, we'll let you know that as well on the site inspection. After the recovery scoping meeting, your project will be begin to be developed by your project team. And we've, we've discussed this, who should be your applicant agent, someone that understands the program elements, someone that's familiar with the computer uh, that, that can navigate, navigate the grants portal, that's well organized and readily available. The delivery model in effect will demand more responsibility and work on the applicant. That's what I said earlier, that uh, one day it's gonna be just a handful of people here from FEMA to help the state manage this themselves with you, the applicant. Pace and priority, you will feel that you're being rushed to supply the required documentation. There again, they're not trying to rush you. It's just being realistic that if we're hit with multiple disasters, FEMA is going to be pulled to the most recent disaster. And what I fear and what's, what has happened to us on these past disasters is that um, FEMA, when they come up to their timelines and they have to go to another disaster, if your projects are not uh, obligated, and, and we've experienced this in the past, those projects are sent to Atlanta, Georgia, to Region 4. They're turned over to someone else that's not familiar with you. We don't get to talk to these people uh, personally. You don't get to talk to them personally. But it's somebody else differently, and it, it just extends the process longer. Uh, it could be months before we can get your project obligated then. So just be mindful to get this documentation to them in a timely manner so that we can have all of your projects obligated and funded before FEMA leaves town. And this just shows you in the past year and a half, how many disasters we've uh, been, uh, that we have declared here in Mississippi. So you can understand it's just affected about the whole state. Um, and it's, it's, it's a timely process However, it's, it's made easier through this grants portal. Uh, it's hopefully we're gonna make it easier on you the way we have assigned project officers by uh, area coordinator regions throughout the state. 
And in summary, the public assistant program assists in the restoration of community infrastructure. And again, this is a supplemental cost reimbursement program for and with specific eligibility requirements. Again, this is our map here. And I know you can't see the your project officer's wording. Uh, we'll also have this map uploaded on our website as well that you can download. Or if you need someone to email you a copy uh, to see who your contact at MEMA would be, we can do that as well. To review an abbreviated version of this applicant briefing slideshow, please visit this website. Shortly after we finish here, it will be uploaded to uh, this site. Here's your MEMA contacts. We have our executive director, Stephen McRaney, our deputy director, Clayton French, who used to be our office uh, public assistance director here at MEMA. Uh, Todd DeMuth is our state coordinating officer and Mike Siler, who you met earlier, he is our public assistance officer here in our office. That concludes our presentation. Do we have any questions? I thank you for your time and- uh, Andy. Yes. What was that website again so I can find out who my coordinator is? Your project officer? Yes. Okay. I'll send you a map. Thank you. Has... Any other questions? Yes. We've already sent everything.